they uh, will conclude the discussion of the hydrogen atom, which we started last time. Okay. If you remember, we eliminated the center of mass and we reduced our problem to finding solutions for the relative motion. So P squared over twice the reduced mass minus Z P squared over the distance from the origin psi of X equal to E psi of X. Okay? Now, uh, obviously, the potential has no minimums. Let me sketch it here. Okay? So, this is the distance from the origin. Uh, and it goes to zero at far away. So, you expect already there will be two types of solutions at this point. For positive energy, you expect essentially waves that go away from the origin and they are obviously modified by the potential but mentally you can think of running waves a bit like the plane waves on the contrary for negative energy huh, there could be discrete bound state staying close to the energy these are the ones we will try to study okay um, um, what would the, uh, the, the continuum of these physical? Physical represents scattering states. So if I have a proton and I send an electron, okay, I have a particle physicist, for instance, then I would like to know what is the probability of finding the electron somewhere in my detector. Okay? So this type of uh, solutions are more uh, of interest to uh, high energy physicists in some sense. We condensed matter physicists think of atoms. So the electron in the, in the uh, hydrogen stays close to the atom or goes to another uh, close by hydrogen. Okay, so bound configurations of all the things. Okay. Will, will we do this scattering problem for hydrogen? No, we don't. Okay. It requires a, a bit of different technology, which is not uh, what it is the core of, the, of our focus. Okay. Um, first of all, there is a first part of the uh, following explanation that applies to any central potential V of R. R mm -hmm. is the, the distance from the origin. So any V of R in some part of the story would be allowed. At a certain point, I will explicitly use the fact that this is one over half, okay, to get the exact solution. But for a while, you might think of an arbitrary uh, potential, central potential. Now, this is the first uh, actor in the story, okay. I want to express this object, which is, by the way, the Laplacian, apart from h bar square. Mm. I want to express it in a way by which I can separate variables. The solution is essentially written again in the uh, electrodynamics books. Mm. You know that I can write a Laplacian in spherical coordinates and if I do so mm, I find spherical harmonics entering the problem. Okay? So in principle I might just proceed by just telling you that. I don't particularly like this way because it's too much, um, I mean, formulas. Okay, so I would like to, I mean, use the fact that we know that there is an angular momentum in quantum physics and this angular momentum has eigenfunctions that you have learned to construct. Okay, so let's follow this route that is a bit less copy the page of Jackson, uh, usually the back page, because it's in one of the... Okay? So, <clears throat> how is P square 
That is our first thing. How is P square related to angular momentum, in particular L square? Okay? The first hint comes from classical physics. Okay? Let me give you a hint. Suppose that I have a particle. Okay? This is the origin. The particle is here at a certain distance on this plane, mm -hmm. and it goes with a certain momentum. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I ask you, what is the angular momentum of this particle? Mm -hmm. Then, obviously, you know how to answer, right? The perpendicular, uh, in classical physics, just classical, okay? The perpendicular component of the momentum is this, okay? Mm -hmm. This is the longitudinal component in the direction of the um, uh, position, right? So what is the angular momentum of this object? Is this distance um, times P uh, orthogonal square, right? Angular momentum is distance times the uh, perpendicular component, you remember, right? X vector P, right? So you square and that's it. Hmm? Is it clear to everybody? Okay. Now, P uh, orthogonal square is equal to P square minus P parallel square, right? The Pythagoras. Okay. Now let's rewrite this in terms of vectors. So the first is P square, right? And the second is what? Minus R square, um, R square P parallel square. How would you express it? I have a, a, a proposal. X dot P square, right? Because it's the, the component of P parallel to X that counts in the scalar product. Okay? Square. Okay, this is the first possible way in which I can express the square of the angular momentum, and it is in fact correct in classical physics. Now, uh, uh, we're doing quantum mechanics, and therefore you remember that component alpha, mm, in principle is epsilon, alpha, beta, gamma, x, beta, p, gamma, right? You remember the um, anti-symmetric tensor. This is the angular momentum. So suppose that I want L squared. Then L squared is L alpha, L alpha, obviously sum over alpha. Okay? So sometimes people use a convention where if a double index is uh, present, you should sum over it. Okay? So I do not put here a sum over alpha. I could put it as long as we agree. Hmm? Okay. Now, I substitute this, and therefore I have epsilon alpha. Hmm. What, what did I use here? Um, okay. Uh, yes. Abs uh, I, I need two. So, I will use epsilon ij xi pj, and then I have epsilon alpha lm xlpm. Uh, okay? Is it clear? I need two pairs of indices because I have to sum over those, but they have to be in general different, right? Uh, this alpha, on the contrary, I sum over. Hmm? This is what's written there, the square of the angular moment. So there are two x and two p's. And obviously, I can rearrange these things, but I have to be careful to commutators, okay? So here also there are two x and two p's, but in a way that is somehow disregarding commutators, okay? So to do that, I use the following um, fact about um, uh, the uh, anti-symmetric tensor. I, I write it here. If I have epsilon alpha ij, epsilon alpha lm, okay, and I am summing over, remember that these three indices have to be different, right? 
and the result will be plus one or minus one depending on the order if it is cyclic <coughs> or or not okay uh, so these three indices are different and these three indices are different you realize therefore that since i and j have to be different from alpha but also L and M have to be different from alpha and from each other, hmm, there are only two possibilities. Either this is equal to this and this is equal to that, or the reverse. This equal to this and this equal to that. Hmm? Now, needless to say, uh, one comes with the sign plus and the other comes with a mi uh, minus sign because you are somehow uh, interchanging one thing. So it takes just a little bit of uh, um, um, thinking to deduce that this object is either plus or minus one. It is plus if J, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> uh, <coughs> it's yeah, in fact, for some, uh, it is I, I, L. I used a different notation in the thing, but that's in the notes. J, uh, M minus delta I, uh, M delta J, L. Okay? These are the two possibilities with their sign. If you do that, then you realize that here, most of the indices have to pair. Okay, by forming either x square, p square, or x dot p. Okay, so please do this careful exercise, and you will find the following uh, not difficult results, but it requires a little bit of r square, p square, minus x dot p square, plus i h bar x dot p okay so this is the only term that is new you see it has a h bar explicitly in front okay it comes from the careful treatment of commutators of this thing when you rearrange everything you have to respect the commutator of x and p and there comes the result okay so you see it is something missing in this simple classical derivation. <coughs> okay, <coughs> I don't do the algebra. It, it takes 10 minutes, but you have to do it uh, I mean, with some calm, okay? But just using that uh, rule. Okay, now we are almost done. Remember, I want this in terms of this, okay? Hmm? So obviously you might say, okay, let me invert, and I write p squared, okay, bring the two terms on this side, mm -hmm. and then divide also by 1 over r squared, so I have 1 over r squared x dot p squared, and then I have minus i h bar over r squared x dot p and then I have plus 1 over r square l square. Is it clear? Yes. This is what we just derived. <coughs> okay. Now, a little bit more of uh, algebra. If you remember, we already We already expressed the gradient in spherical coordinates. Okay? It was a long exercise of calculus essentially, which we did together. Hmm? And we uh, realized that this is a radial vector times the derivative with respect to r plus the theta vector times 1 over r, the derivative with respect to theta plus the phi vector times 1 over r sine theta times the derivative with respect to phi. You remember, right? The three 
unit vectors of the radial coordinates, mm. we did this by just calculating explicitly the Jacobian. Mm. Now, multiplied by x, remember, x is equal to r times r, right? Is the vector of distance r from the origin radial vector. Mm. So multiplied by x, this object, and you will find that this is equal to r, r dotted into this. So this disappears, this disappears, and this with itself gives me just one. So r d in the r. Is it clear? Nice. Now I put here a, I want p, so x dot p. Mm -hmm. p is minus i h bar the gradient, right? So this is equal to minus i h bar r d in the r. Is it clear? Fantastic. So I have here the ingredient, one. Mm -hmm. The second ingredient uh, is, is the same, in fact, is this, okay? So, okay, let's use this in here, okay? So this is equal to 1 over r squared. Now I have minus i h bar r d in the r squared. Square means applying one after the other, right? That's the meaning of the square of, the, of, of an operator. Hmm? And then I have minus i h bar over r squared times minus i h bar r d in the r. Mm. Finally, plus 1 over r square uh, l square. Okay? Do you follow so far? Okay. Now, this object, let me rewrite it here. Can I erase this? Yes. Mm. So this object is now uh, minus and minus is a plus, i square is a minus, so minus h bar square. Then I have, uh, let's see, let me write it like this. Um, I have 1 over r square, and then I have r, I, I write it once more, r d in the r acting on r d in the R. This term is plus i squared is a minus h bar r over r squared is 1 over r. So minus h bar squared, uh, squared 1 over r and then in the r hmm? plus 1 over r squared l squared. Okay? I just almost did nothing. Just copy. Hmm? And now let's calculate this. Hmm? When I take the derivative, I can take it here or here. Okay? So, if I take it here, it's a second derivative. Yeah. Multiplied by r squared and divided by r squared. So the result is minus h bar squared, the second derivative. Okay? If I take it here, the derivative of r gives me just 1, and the result is r d in the r, divided by r square is 1 over r d in the r. Precisely this, okay? So it's in fact minus twice h bar square over r d in the r. Okay? And then I have the last term, so let me just put these two terms in common with this object here. Okay, I just put the minus h bar square in front, 1 over l squared, l squared. Okay, so finally we have p squared expressed as a radial part, funny looking, mm. it's not exactly second derivative. This you would expect, second derivative with respect to the radial coordinate, right? Uh, but uh, it's not exactly that. Okay, there it is. Hmm. And then I have plus 
1 over r square L square, which as you know depends only on theta and phi. So this part here depends only on theta, phi and derivative of theta and phi. But even more, I know it's taking functions, they are the spherical harmonics. Mm -hmm. You did the exercise. So we should use exactly this trick now to separate radial motion from angular motion. Mm -hmm. Okay? Is it clear? What's the strategy? Good. So let's proceed. <coughs> so to proceed, I say, okay, rather than looking for psi of x, generic, I will write it as the radial part, which depends only on r, times a function of theta and phi. I anticipate, you can put any function, I anticipate that the right function to put is obviously eigenfunction of L squared. So this already brings two indices in my problem, the L and M value of the angular momentum of this problem. Okay? which I should put it here. Uh, in general, okay, once I, uh, here I will find in a second L, L plus 1. You will see soon, okay? So in general, the radial problem will know about L as well, okay? So the changing L changes the radial Schrodinger equation. However, in general, I can find more than one, many radial function for the same L, and therefore I should be ready to introduce some other quantum number, K, never mind what it is, you will see in a second, is an integer at the end, but for the time being I don't know what it is, it's just some label for the possible um, uh, other um, states of the radial problem. Yeah? Can you please explain how R depends on uh, I know, uh, you, you will see that in the radial problem this object appears and therefore I have to be ready to use it so if you wait for say five minutes or more you will see it explicitly I just alluded that in here but you will see it in a second I just prepared I might forget about all indices now okay but I wanted to give you the perspective of wh where we are going to hmm? Okay, so let's calculate now uh, this if I factorize the wave function, okay? So I have there p squared over 2 mu. So I should actually um, have minus h bar squared over 2 mu, the second derivative with respect to r squared plus 2 over r, the first derivative, and then I have plus. 1 over 2 mu r square l square, okay? All this is applied to the wave function. The potential, we need the potential. Plus the potential, sorry. So let me write for a while as a v of r, okay? Later I will use the explicit form. Apply to this psi, so it's some r of r times some function of theta and phi, mm. all this should give me, all this should be give me E times the same function times the same function. Okay? <coughs> now, here there is L square. The theta and phi are only here, right? And we have a function. Hmm? Which function you would select? I mean, it is an obvious choice, right? The spherical harmonics. And this object here, when acting on this thing, will restitute to me what? H bar, L. H bar square L, L plus 1. Right? Okay? Is it clear to everybody? Good. So, if you allow, I just use the blackboard and I substitute here h bar square L L plus 1. Okay? 
That's it. Now you see immediately that this object here is the only place where theta and phi appears, but it's just the same on both sides. So somehow they have done its duty. And the duty was to make L square simple. Hmm? So you realize that I can in fact drop at this point this. Okay? So I drop it. Fantastic. And I do obtain what? An equation for the uh, radial function only. Mm -hmm. And now you see why I added the L. Because this radial function knows about L. Okay? So it explicitly depends on L. Is it clear? Good. So let me write the radial function equation. Mm -hmm. It is written explicitly like this. 2 mu second derivative with respect to r plus 2 over r derivative with respect to r plus h bar square l l plus 1 divided by 2 mu r square plus v of r hmm, times the function r equal to e r uh, of r. Hmm? Now, as I told you, this function should depend on L, okay? but it can depend also on some other label, which I have to specify because there could be many solutions of it. So let's include now the labels. Obviously, in principle, the energies also depend on those labels. By the way, it cannot depend on M, because M never appeared, okay? only L appeared. Okay? Clear? Good. Uh, I think I can erase some of this stuff. Okay, so this is the radial equation which I should solve. For a generic central potential, it's still a considerably simple problem than before, but still difficult. Hmm? The second consideration is that it is not a standard one dimensional problem. You see, that in a one-dimensional problem I would expect this while I have this extra term okay so not standard the normalization also is not particularly standard right because <coughs> how should I normalize this wave functions here I want that the integral from 0 to infinity in the r r square the integral from 0 to pi in d theta sine theta, the integral from 0 to 2 pi in d phi, okay, of the modulus square of this thing, so of r square, or r modulus square, whatever, okay, of r, times y lm of theta and phi modulus square, all this should be 1. Okay? But luckily enough, the spherical harmonics are always assumed to be normalized, right? So this part of the integral is automatically 1 if you properly normalize the, the spherical harmonics, and therefore the remaining integral is this one. R squared times r of r squared. Okay? Now, let me write it like this, in fact. So, what is equal to 1 is the integral of r times big R. Hmm? Not the integral of square. Not the integral of r square. Hmm? And the r square comes from the Jacobian huh? in three dimensions. Now, this suggests that maybe, maybe, uh, a better function is precisely r times big R. Hmm? Okay, so let's introduce a new function. Hmm? Uh, obviously, there will be uh, labels here, which in some of the steps that I do now, I will drop anyway. Hmm? And I ask you to consider the following thing. Suppose that I do a derivative 
with respect to R of this function U. Hmm? So of U. So this is derivative with respect to R of R times R. Okay? So this is equal to R plus R B in the R of R. Is it clear? Now I take a second derivative with respect to R of U. So I take a one further derivative, which is equal to derivative with respect to R of this object here, of R plus R D in the R of R. Okay? So the first term gives me derivative of R. The, this first term, if I take the derivative here, gives me exactly a similar uh, object. So I have, in fact, a factor 2. If I don't take it, and I take the derivative there, I find R second derivative. R second derivative. Okay? Is it clear so far? Okay. Now I put here 1 over 1 over R. Okay, 1 over R. 1 over R. 1 over R. Okay? And you realize that this object, second derivative, plus 2 over R, first derivative, is precisely what appears here. Is it clear? Okay. Good. So, in terms of U, the algebra is slightly simplified, the calculus, hmm? and here I can write minus h bar square over twice mu, okay, there uh, I have this, this object appear uh, applied to that, so it's 1 over r, second derivative of u. K, uh, with respect to the second derivative, okay? Um, plus uh, h bar square L, L plus 1 divided by 2 mu r square and then I have r, but r is equal to u of K, L divided by r, right? And then I have plus v times the same object. So let me just, in fact, glue together the two things. Okay? It would be simpler. Equal to E K L U K L divided by R. Sorry. Let's make it. Okay? Is it clear? Yes. I just substituted that expression and the fact that R is equal to u divided by r. Hmm? And now you see the miracle. The 1 over r here, the 1 over r here, and the 1 over r here, in fact, go away. Hmm? And therefore, if you allow me just to use this, now you see that the equation for u is beautiful, right? Because it has the standard form, second derivative. Okay? Uh, and more than that, even this is beautiful, because that's equal to, so you can say that 1 is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity in the R of u, k, l of R modulus squared. Okay, so the normalization condition is standard. Standard 1D. Obviously half line eh, is the radial part. And the Schrodinger equation is also a standard Schrodinger equation, okay? where the only thing to notice is that there is the potential and beyond that there is a piece of potential which is due to the angular momentum which looks like a centrifugal potential energy. In other words, if this is the central potential, so for instance in the Coulomb problem this, this object is like that, okay? So this is L L plus 1 divided by uh, R squared. So in fact, you see that this goes to infinity, if L is different from 0, obviously, much faster than this. 
because this goes like 1 over r, and this 1 over r squared. Therefore, if L is different from 0, and I sum the two, I obtain something like this. Okay? So the effective potential, I might call this V effective, which obviously depends on L, hmm, has a shape of this type. Okay? So for very large distances, this is negligible with respect to 1 over r, but for very short, it's quite the opposite. It's going to infinity. Hmm? And you expect that somehow the particle would like to live in this region, okay, close to the well, hmm? which is in fact uh, what the bound states will do, okay? So this is the, <coughs> the description, uh, the description so far. Hmm? Uh, a one-dimensional problem with an effective potential, which is in part of um, angular momentum origin, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's the problem that I have to solve. So from a six-dimensional problem of two particles, center of mass, I go, uh, I go to a three-dimensional problem, spherical uh, harmonics, and I separate the, harmonic, the angular variables, and I reduce to a, a radial problem, one dimension. This is already much simpler. I could even adventure uh, to try to solve this on a computer. Okay? I have a one-dimensional differential equation and I try to discretize and do something. Okay? But luckily enough, when V of R is equal to minus Z e squared over R, we can exactly solve it. Okay? Which is what I'm going to show next. Okay? Is it clear so far? Now, the step that is almost essential in order to avoid writing too much is to switch to dimensionless variables. Okay? You see, the problem is full of h-bars, obviously, but there are also the mass, mm -hmm. the reduced mass of this radial uh, motion, and and there, is, and there is the electric charge, by the way, here. Mm -hmm. So, shall we find uh, good dimensionless, good units for this problem? Okay, so what, what would be a possible hint for the good units? If you remember what we did for the harmonic oscillator, we said, let's find some length Mm -hmm. such that the potential energy and the kinetic energy expressed in terms of that length are the same. Mm -hmm. Let's try to do the same. Let's find a length. The length is here called A. Mm -hmm. And in a second will be the Bohr length. Mm -hmm. Such that Z e square over A, this is an energy, right? Is the potential energy full of energy associated to the Coulomb potential for a length A. Mm -hmm. I uh, pretend that this is equal to h bar over mu A squared. This is also an energy because it is the kinetic energy of the order of, notice there is no factor 2 here, okay? Is of the order of kinetic energy associated to a particle confined in a, a region uh, A. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can certainly write this equation, okay? And I can find what is A such that the two things are the same, because here one goes, and you can find that A is equal to h bar square divided by mu e square over z, okay? Now, this object is called the Bohr length of this problem. Okay? Now, in particular, in particular, the Bohr, what is called the Bohr radius, is usually this one. Okay? So this is when you have z equal 1. That is h bar over mass e squared. Mm -hmm. And this is, by the way, a good way to mm, somehow remember the formula for the Bohr radius. I tend to uh, forget because I mean uh, obviously there is always Google that will tell you huh? but if you do not have your internet connection remember 
kinetic energy mm, equal to Coulomb energy and find the, um, the solution. Okay, now, good. At this point, if I substitute here the ball radius, which is that, I do have two ways of expressing an energy, okay? And I will call this object the Hartree energy. So to repeat is Z is square over the ball radius, okay? Substitute the expression for the ball radius and you will find that this is equal to the mass e to the 4 z square divided by h bar square, okay? This, when z is equal to 1, is twice the real value, okay? So it's twice the negative energy of our hydrogen atom problem, okay? Now, these two units are very, very useful. So useful in atomic physics that you will often find abbreviated in AU, atomic units. Notice, not Hartree units, but atomic units, okay? So energy is measured in Hartree and length measured in Bohr radii, okay? Obviously, time would be measured in h bar over eb, hmm? but time is not often uh, used in, the, in this uh, um, time independence sharing and problems. Okay? Is it clear? Okay, good. Now, once I have my good guess of the units, hmm, I do um, perform the explicit, the explicit transformation, and the transformation is that from R, I divide it by the ball radius, and I define a dimensionless um, length, a dimensionless radial distance, okay? Obviously, instead of E, mm, I divide by the heart tree, mm, and I obtain a, a dimensionless energy, E tilde, let's call it E tilde for lack of a better name, mm. And, and, and what? What else? Now, given a certain u of kl, this is a function of r. Mm? Now, you know that r is equal to a, b times uh, rho, okay? There comes a u tilde as a function of rho, okay? It's a function of rho. Now, this is a bit too fast because in some sense, I also have to make sure that the normalization is preserved, right? And if I change variables here, this is the integral from 0 to infinity of, in d rho, r is equal to uh, ab, so there is ab times d rho, right? Times u uh, of uh, kl r equal to um, uh, a, b, rho, okay? This is the change of variables done in the thing. So you suspect that the right uh, function is not simply what I wrote there, but rather square root of a, b, okay? You see from here. In any case, this is a very minor object. So, the correct rescaling is that, mm? but other than that, I, you can... After all, this is only useful for normalization at the end, okay? So, if you forget and write like this, it wouldn't be a great uh, dishonor for you. It, it is only that you have to be careful that the normalization of the two is not uh, compatible. I mean, if one is correctly normalized, the, one, the other would not be correctly normalized unless you add an appropriate square root of Okay? Good. Um, well, having done that, I can uh, actually perform my perform my uh, uh, rescaling. Mm? 
and the rescaling is very very simple mm -hmm. you essentially totally equivalent believe me just do it explicitly but totally equivalent to putting h bar equal to 1 mu equal to 1 and wherever you see r substitute with rho the dimensionless thing okay so the description of this thing is minus one half second derivative uh, with respect to rho of u tilde plus l l plus one divided by two, two rho square now i do the coulomb problem okay so if I, I use here the fact that this was minus z e squared over r and if you see here I have uh, the essentially uh, a b times rho and this is the energy which I divide at the end everything for so let me write it and then we comment on the origin hmm? so this object is equal to e tilde K L uh, U tilde K L of rho. Is it clear? So you see, I divide everything by both uh, the half tree in such a way that this disappears and the energy becomes E tilde. Mm -hmm. And here uh, this term disappears because the uh, 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 the energy is also equal to h bar square over mu a b. Okay, so it goes away. Mm -hmm. Sorry, is this the yeah. part is that all these derivations can be kept without specifying exactly the Coulomb potential? No, because I was I was trying to, to keep track of uh, where do you put exactly the Coulomb potential in order like to think like putting something more general instead at this point is more general. But if I want to use I mean if I uh, <laughs> The Coulomb potential is here in, in my choice of the unit. You might say, forget, I use the Hartree as units and the potential is, okay, you, you can do it. But at that point, this is the potential, okay, expressed in terms of A, B, rho and divided by the Hartree, okay? It's not as nice as a simple one over rho, okay? If you, if you what? I mean, in many atomic problems, I might use these units, even if they are not exactly um, Coulomb, um, whatever. Okay, so you, there is a little bit more of generality. But in some sense, this is what I want to do now, the Coulomb problem, and therefore it is uh, the ideal place where I can <coughs> use these units. I don't know if I answered this. So there is a little bit more of generality in the sense that nobody forbids you from using uh, uh, Hartree and, uh, and, and Bohr as units in whatever problem you want. Now, you okay. know, I think I was trying to see how much of all these can I use with different potentials in this uh, spherical three-dimensional scenario? Almost everything. Again, except for this little piece which in this case became this little and simple function minus 1 over r and in a more general central potential you should put there an appropriate function okay so everything i would say except for what follows now which is very specific to this okay but for the rest everything clear so far okay so as if h bar was 1 mu was 1, uh, z e square was 1, okay, everything was 1, mm -hmm. I have take this uh, radial equation that I have to solve, okay, and this is what I want to do now, and this time I, I, I would like to finish, okay, so if you allow me, I, I would start now, uh, I would start from on this again mm. I'll try to leave it there although it's in, in, in the middle of my blackboard okay mm. now when you start solving a problem
or like this, the first thing that you would like to understand is how would the solution behave in the two limits. I have to solve this problem in zero infinity. So let's try to guess how it goes, the solution when rho goes to zero and when rho goes to infinity. Mm? Okay, so suppose that u of rho, okay, I will omit the tilde, almost invariable. It is, it's too much writing, okay? Well, here I can leave, but u is simply too much. Um, suppose that this is equal to some constant mm, times rho to some power. Well, I don't know if, if it is even uh, 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 an integer or half in for any power, okay? Plus other terms which are less relevant. So, for instance, higher exponent, okay? So, if this was 1, this is maybe 2 or, okay, a higher exponent. So, close to the origin, this dominates over anything with a higher exponent. <coughs> Let me calculate the, uh, this term, okay? So it's a second derivative. From now on, I will indicate the derivative to save chalk, uh, rather than with the, this uh, notation with the prime and double prime. Mm -hmm. So prime, the first derivative, double prime, the second derivative. This is, by the way, what the mathematicians would do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the first derivative is a1, and then I get down alpha1, and then if I do the second derivative, I get alpha 1 minus 1, rho alpha 1 minus 2, plus dots. Is it clear? Okay, then I look at this object, and I find here minus 1 half a1 alpha 1 alpha 1 minus 1, rho alpha 1 minus 2, plus dots. Hmm? And here I get L, L plus 1 divided by 2, and I have A1, again rho to the alpha 1, but then there is a rho square, so rho to the alpha 1 minus 2. Did you follow? Same exponent, but not because of the second derivative, but because of this rho square. Hmm? What about this? Well, this is less. Uh, Divergent, so it is minus, so obviously plus, uh, I should always write this uh, plus dots. And the other one is minus a1 uh, rho to the alpha 1 minus 1 plus dots. Mm -hmm. Equal to e tilde kl a1 rho to the alpha 1 plus dots. Okay? Is it clear? I assumed a form of this type, I did my second derivative, I kept the most relevant term, and I looked at the expression. And then I realized that this is certainly the object with smaller exponent. You see, this is a, an extra row. And this is, in fact, two extra rows. So when row goes to zero, these two terms have an equal importance and dominate over everything else. Is it clear? So think of rho equal to, say, uh, sorry, alpha 1 equal to 1. Mm? Then this is a constant, this goes to 0, and this diverges, okay, with that. Mm? Is it clear? But in fact, in order for the equality to hold, I have to balance these two terms. And to balance, you see, a1 is appearing in both. So all I have to do, and one half by the way also, all I have to do is that this has to balance with this, okay? So I conclude from this analysis that you better have alpha 1, alpha 1 minus 1 exactly equal to L, L plus 1, otherwise something goes wrong for rho going to 0. Hmm? So whatever alpha you have there, you better satisfy this. Hmm? Otherwise, this would not uh, be good. Now, what are the solutions of this equation? I, I, I mean, it's very simple to show that there is one that is L plus one. 
You see, if this is L plus 1, this is L, and this is equal to L times L plus 1. So this is obvious. But there is a second um, one. Uh, by the way, L is, goes from 0 to infinity, so this is always positive. Okay? So in some sense here we are describing things that go to 0 with some, uh, in fact, integer exponents, which could be 1, 2, 3, whatever, depending on L. The second possibility is um, alpha 1 equal to minus L. This is less or equal to 0. So we are describing things that in fact diverge. Well, you might say no, for L equals 0 they don't diverge. They are just going to a constant. Mm? Well, you understand that this is physically very, very, very strange. First of all, it's telling you that as you increase L, suppose that L is minus 3, hmm? uh, which means that the centrifugal term is larger, okay, so it's trying to push away the wave function from the origin, but the wave function, in fact, diverges even more strongly. Strange, right? It is very strange. Don't you find this so? Hmm. So you start developing some skeptical feelings about this second possibility. And in fact, I can guarantee that this is not allowed. Uh, still you might say, wait, but what about for L equals 0? For L equals 0, alpha 1 is 0. So maybe it's still possible? No, not even that. Because if alpha 1 is 0, L equals 0, then a constant u means that r, which remember is u over r, is essentially a over r. Hmm? It means that the radial function is in fact diverging, like 1 over r. And by the way, L is 0, and therefore the spherical harmonics are just 1 over 4 pi. So the solution is is this psi equal to constant divided by r a possible solution? The answer is obviously not, because <coughs> if I apply the Laplacian to 1 over r, what do I get? Electromagnetism? Minus 4 pi the delta. Remember the Poisson problem? <coughs> 1 over r <coughs> is the potential associated to the point charge. <coughs> Therefore, there is no possible, I mean, here, the Laplacian is what enters here. And then there is some potential. Okay? How would you possibly eliminate this delta? There's no possibility, because the potential has no delta, okay? And the function here is not a delta, it's 1 over r. So you realize immediately that it is impossible to cancel the delta function arri arising from the Laplacian, okay? It's, it's not normalizable. Huh? It's not normalizable. It is also, uh, it is also not normalizable, uh, yes. It is not normalizable. But that's not strong enough to cancel it out. That's Normalization? Yeah, because the clear winds are also not normalized. Yeah, but here we would like to find uh, bound states. <coughs> so we actually want. There are several arguments. In the notes you will find another one, which is related to the fact that the radial momentum is not derivative with respect to R, and to define a properly admission radial momentum you have to play a little bit, you will find the solution in the notes. And in that case, you realize that in order to make it a mission, the condition that you have to impose is that the functions always vanish at the origin, okay? So this wouldn't vanish, okay? While all these functions vanish at the origin, okay? So the boundary condition to be used is vanishing u at the origin. Which doesn't mean that R vanishes, okay? If U vanishes, uh, and it vanishes at least as R, 
okay? So if punish is like R, the big function R might be a constant. But certainly not diverge. Okay? This is the thing that emerged from this discussion. Okay, in any case, let's just uh, drop this case and we keep this. Okay? Good. Second part of the story. What happens for very large uh, infinity, uh, for rho going to infinity? Here you realize that when rho goes to infinity, this goes to zero. In fact, it goes to zero faster than that. Okay? So these two terms, in fact, will leave our um, discussion. This is a constant, in fact, a negative constant. Okay? So the most relevant terms are this against this. Okay? So for very strong, uh, long R, uh, rho, I have to essentially solve minus one half the second derivative uh, equal to e tilde of u. Okay? Now, and this is a negative function. This is a, like, a, like a free particle with a negative energy. Do you remember what is the solution? Okay. Not oscillatory, but u, okay, l, e to the minus lambda times rho. Okay? In such a way that when you take the second derivative, you get lambda squared. Okay? Then I get the minus one half, and I get the e. Okay? So somehow lambda is essentially related to uh, the energy mm? and you can even write that lambda kl there is equal to um, the square root of minus twice the energy. Okay? That is what you would expect from this analysis. That the function decays exponentially fast uh, with a, a, a rate of decay that is controlled by the energy of the bound state. So the, the, the more it is profound, the faster is the decay, the more it's shallow, the slower is the decay. Okay? Is it clear? By the way, I will make you notice that, in fact, there is another solution of this, which is the one with the plus. Okay? This explodes, and obviously we don't want that. Hmm? So we want just a decaying exponential. Okay, we are now ready mm. to to do the uh, the algebra, mm. and in fact, to, as a warm up, let's do the following. To put that I ask you, okay, put um, L equal to zero to simplify our things. So this object is not there, and let's try to find with the information we have a good wave function. Okay? Then you might say, okay, then I take u for l equal to zero, I take it as some constant time. Well, let's see. It has to start with a power of one. Okay? So power of one. There. It has to uh, decay exponentially. So e to the minus lambda rho. Okay. That's, I glue together these two information, small r and large r, and then write the function. Okay. Is this a good function? Let's try to verify. So I have to take the mm, first derivative, the second derivative, substitute here. Okay. Mm. Shall we do it? It is a very simple exercise, so I don't want to uh, waste too much time, but let's do it. So this is equal to a times e to the minus lambda rho plus um, uh, the derivative rho times minus lambda e to the minus lambda rho. Okay? Then I take the second derivative, okay, which is equal to a, then I get minus lambda e to the minus lambda rho, plus, if I take a derivative of this, I get exactly the same term, so minus 2, and then I get plus rho minus lambda square e to the minus lambda rho. Okay? I did the second derivative. And then I have minus one half this term, so a times minus two lambda e to the minus lambda rho is in fact common to both, so I will put it out plus rho 
minus lambda square, okay, e to the minus lambda rho. Do you follow so far? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This this term. And then I have this is not there. I have minus one over rho. And then I have a rho e to the minus lambda rho. And this should be equal to e tilde uh, of uh, uh, a rho e to the minus lambda rho. Okay? Is it clear? Okay, let's try to uh, do the uh, algebra. This goes away. Um, by the way, e to the minus lambda rho is present everywhere. You can drop it out. Hmm? So, and, and in fact, the normalization constant a also drops out. So let's do the, the, uh, the, the, the final arrangements. So I have plus uh, lambda here, mm -hmm. uh, uh, plus uh, rho, minus. no, minus. minus rho half lambda square equal to, no, minus uh, e to the mi uh, no, minus 1, mm, because everything uh, went away, equal to e times rho. Okay? Now, <clears throat> you see that the, if I uh, use the fact that minus lambda squared divided by 2 is equal to the energy, these two things are in fact the same. Right? But in order for this equation to be valid, I should have also lambda equal to 1. Right? Mm -hmm. So if lambda is equal to 1 and e, e, e tilde, whatever, is equal to minus lambda squared over 2, which for lambda equal to 1 is minus 1 half, this is a wave function. Okay? And this is in fact the ground state. Minus 1 half what? Hard. So the rig break. Mm? Okay, so we have just learned that somehow using information that we already obtained, mm, we can write a very, very simple form of functions with the correct behavior, and in fact, we find the ground state of the hydrogen atom. Okay, now we have to be ready to do the full algebra, which is not the most entertaining things in the world, but um, we have to do it, okay? So let's let's see. Mm. Okay, so let me erase all of this stuff, almost all of it. <coughs> so be ready for some uh, boring thing. So first of all. Mm. If I tell you UKL of rho, what will be? Will be some object that has to start in this way, so let me call it WKL of rho, and it, uh, it must have some exponential. No? Okay? Because, so it must be the exponential multiplied by something, and this something, okay, you can, um, from what we said, must be something which starts with rho to the power l plus 1, mm -hmm. but can go on, so some coefficient c0 plus c1 uh, rho plus, I write a power series, okay? The first term of the power series is perfectly consistent with this object, okay? So with the small rho analysis. Mm -hmm. The remaining thing, mm -hmm is essentially governed by the exponential. Mm? Clear? Good. So the first thing that we do is to write the equation rather than for uh, u here. I write an equation for w. Okay? So what I do? I calculate the first derivative of u equal to first derivative of w times e to the minus lambda rho. I omit most of the indices, otherwise I get crazy. Plus W minus lambda e to the minus lambda. Second derivative equal to 
second derivative of this, no, yes, second derivative of this, e to the minus lambda rho, then I have the first derivative of that, okay, times the minus lambda coming from this. Then look at this. Why minus lambda in, in W? What? It, the, min the minus lambda has to be in front of W and the argument is rho. Oh, the argument I am... Yes. This is I not the argument. So, R sorry. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm terribly but sorry. But no. I am omitting all arguments, omitting all indices. Okay? So these are not arguments, but factors. Okay. Which more, less ambiguous, I would put it here, okay? But don't let me erase things for this, okay? Good. So, this comes from the first term. Then, derivative of this will give you W prime times minus L again. So, a factor 2. Hmm? Uh, and then, what, what else? Uh, I have minus lambda, let me put this first. W times another factor of minus lambda, so minus lambda squared e to the minus lambda rho. Okay? Is it clear? Mm -hmm. Good. Now, um, in fact, let me just write it as w, okay? Then I have minus 2 lambda w prime, mm -hmm. and then I have plus minus lambda squared w times e to the minus lambda rho. That's the change from u to w. Mm. Okay, uh, let's do it here. Mm. Okay. Now, 
I do uh, write this is W of rho. Okay, so I write it in the following way: it's a, a, a power series. I write the sum of the Q from zero to infinity of C Q rho to the uh, Q plus L plus one. Is it clear to everybody? For Q equals zero, I get C zero times rho to the L plus one, and then C one with an extra power, and so on and so forth. Okay, good. Now. I have to calculate the first derivative of this, okay, dropping down this, and then the second derivative, dropping down one further factor, okay? Believe me, okay, it takes essentially uh, one second, in fact, it's explicit essentially. So it is like this, minus one half, sum from q equal to zero to infinity of Q plus L plus 1, this originates from the first derivative, uh, and then I have Q plus L from the second derivative, and then I have CQ, because it's the coefficient, and then I have rho to the Q plus L minus 1. Is it clear? This is the second derivative of W, calculated rather fast, but I mean, very simple. And then I have plus lambda, the first derivative, so sum from q equal to 0 to infinity of, all the one term comes down, so it's equal to q plus l plus 1 times cq times rho to the q plus l, decreased by 1. Is it clear? Good. Mm. Okay, and then I have this, so plus L, L plus 1, divided by 2, and then I have the subject here, which is sum from 0 to infinity of CQ, rho to the Q plus L, there is a plus 1, but there is a rho square, and therefore minus 1. And finally, I have minus sum from q equal to 0 to infinity of cq. There is uh, this plus 1, but there is a factor 1 over rho, so it becomes rho to the q plus l. All this should be 0. Is it clear? Okay, I told you it was a bit uh, annoying, but... Uh, Okay, so the first thing that we notice is the following. Look at the expression that I underline. Here there is L, L plus 1, divided by 2 with a minus sign. And here there is L, L plus 1, divided by 2 with a plus sign. The rest is the same. You see the exponent and the coefficient are the same. Okay? So do you agree that these two terms cancel? If you remember, when we analyzed the row going to zero term, we said, ah, the second derivative and the um, uh, orbital uh, angular momentum motion uh, should... Uh, uh, we selected, we selected this object, okay, this alpha one, in such a way that there was precisely the cancellation we are now observing, okay? So it's not a coincidence, it's because we prepared somehow our uh, solution to have the correct thing in such a way that this goes away. So this and this goes away. I have to keep track only of this times that, this, sorry, so the two terms are minus one half sum from zero to infinity. Let's see, I get, let me just be prepared for what I should write. I should keep only what? Q times Q plus L mm, plus L plus 1 times Q. So times Q times L plus 1. Is it clear? These are the, the only surviving terms. Okay? If I erase the L times L plus 1. And if you rearrange the two uh, terms, you find Q times Q 
plus 2L plus 1. Clear? Time C cube times rho to the Q plus L minus 1. Okay, good. And this has gone. Good, so I can erase. Now, I would like to have the same object there, okay? So let me define Q prime equal to Q plus 1. Okay? So I rewrite this term here as plus lambda sub over Q prime that now goes from 1 to infinity of, here I have Q plus 1, so Q prime plus L, C of Q prime uh, minus 1, right? Yes. And here I have rho of uh, Q prime plus L minus 1. Is it clear? I just changed variable in my summation. Mm. And then I do the same here. So I have minus the sum from Q prime equal to 1 to infinity of C Q prime minus 1 rho of Q prime plus L minus 1. So again, the rationale is that I wanted the same object appearing. Mm. And now you might say, yes, but this starts from 1 and this starts from 0. Really? No. There is a Q in front. Okay, so the Q, in fact, zero term counts nothing. Yeah. So this starts from one. And is it important, the name that I give to a, a, a dummy variable? No, it's not important. Okay? So let me just re-establish the Q. Is it clear? Yeah. I did a couple of steps, but I think it's reasonably clear that this is the object that should be zero. And nicely enough, now I have a sum of infinite terms from 1 to infinity of coefficients and integers, or, or with this lambda also, all multiplying the same coefficient, the same power uh, coefficient. Okay? Good. So, mm. let me re-express the thing. We are almost done, I guarantee. How are we? Mm, pretty bad. But let me do it. Mm. So I have the following. Uh, I have the sum from Q equal to 1 to infinity of minus Q Q plus 2L plus 1 divided by 2 times CQ from this term and then I have plus here I have the lambda let me re-establish in this last step the fact that this, this is a lambda of KL which multiplies Q plus L and 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 there is a minus 1 from here all together multiplying Q minus 1, okay? All this multiplied by rho of Q plus L minus 1 should be 0, okay? Now, how can an infinite sum with this power be 0 for all of rho? The coefficient should be 0. So you already got the fact that this should be 0. This implies a recursive equation. You see, in this coefficient there is CQ, but there is also C minus Q. Okay? So you can write a recursive formula. The recursive formula, if you establish what CQ is, is the following. is twice, because of this 2 here, and then I have lambda KL L plus 1 uh, sorry, Q plus L minus 1, which is this, mm. divided by this coefficient, so Q, Q plus 2L plus 1, and multiplied by C of Q minus 1. Okay? There it is. You give me C0, mm, and I can find for you C1. Just plug numbers. Mm. And then you put C1 here, I can find C2 and so on and so forth. So from C0, arbitrary, 
I get C1, and then I get C2, and then I proceed with the recursive formula. And I get all the coefficients. Okay? And I can do that. Always. In fact, I can do it for every value of lambda, which means for every value of the negative energy, which means that I have not found a discrete spectrum. So something here calls for our attention. Hmm? Superficially, at least, my solution holds nicely for every value of lambda. So the recursive formula and this solves our problem. The point is that this infinite power has to finish. I must have a polynomial and not an infinite power law. The reason for that calls for one minute and I would spare, but you find it in the notes. And it's the following, that if you actually find the infinite solution, then that is not a bound state. That will give to you the e to the plus lambda rho. Okay? So, see the uh, explanation in the notes to uh, uh, understand that you have to exclude, uh, in fact, infinite power laws. So, you have to have finite polynomial. Hmm? Otherwise, what you get is, in fact, an exploding function. Hmm? So, let me cut the thing because we are tired and we are kind of late. So, the solution is that you have to stop at some integer k, okay? So k is the last, the last term uh, uh, or better, is the term, okay, which drops to zero. So from uh, k on, all are zero, okay? So k obviously has to be at least one, k greater or equal to one. It's an integer, okay? In the easiest case, you just stop here. C0 and C1 is 0. Okay? Or you can go two steps. C0, C1, and C2 is 0, if K is 2. Okay? So K is the first mm -hmm. integer greater or equal to 1 for which this coefficient drops to 0. How should I calculate? Well, evidently, this has to be 0. Right? So, if I have Q equal to k, hmm? I have lambda k l times k plus l minus 1. This has to be 0 in order for this to be true, right? So you see that immediately the, the q there, okay, and the k, which was an arbitrary label so far, which I included, are in fact related in a very strict way. And this gives me immediately the fact that lambda is equal to 1 divided by the sum of two integers. 1 is the angular momentum, so this is greater or equal to 0. And this is the so-called radial quantum number. Because, after all, it governs how many coefficients you have in this polynomial which means how many zeros this polynomial, this radial polynomial has, okay? So the radial quantum number is the k. Now, the sum of these two integers is called n, is the principal quantum number, okay? So this is the principal, okay? Why principal? Because in the end, the energy, which I now rewrite in the following way. It depends only on the uh, square of lambda, so it's minus one half the square of that quantity, so the square of k plus l, okay? But this is minus n squared, okay? So it doesn't depend on l and k separately, but just on the sum, okay? And this is essentially the hydrogen spectrum solution, okay? So next time, I think we should stop here. Next time we discuss a little bit about the feature of the radial function, the S, the P functions, and so on and so forth, 1S, 2S, and, but this uh, has to wait a little bit. Okay, almost done, say 15 minutes to finish. <laughs>